Well, uh, you need a you need a quick break to go before you go into your workshop or not? You ready? Very good. All right. Without objection, I would ask uh, Erica Yeldon, who is going to be unable to be with us on Thursday for the board education presentation, uh, to be able to just address us. This isn't a we're not having a discussion, but she just wants to not being able to be here on uh, Thursday be able to uh, address us as the Chairman of the Board of Education. Go here. Thank you. <clears throat> Greetings. My name is Erica Gelvin, and I am the Chair of the Clinton Board of Education. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you about the Board's proposed operating budget in advance of the formal pr uh, budget presentation. Uh, my teaching schedule does prevent me from being here on Thursday, so I encourage you to please reach out if you have any questions or concerns after the presentation on Thursday. Um, I can be reached at egelvin at clintonpublic.net, and I'm also happy to share my um, cell phone number with you if you would prefer to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, but send me an email because I really want my personal cell phone to be part of the public record. Um, what does it cost to operate a school district? This was the overarching question that guided our budgetary work this year. Not how do we cover our wish list, not how do we continue to function and fund our schools the way we have in, the, in years past, not how do we increase or maintain funding without thoroughly considering and vetting the programmatic impact of our budgetary decisions. Instead, the question was, what does it cost to operate a school district? What does it cost to provide the knowledge and skills necessary for the students of Clinton to pursue the life and goals they have for themselves once they have graduated from the Morgan School? What budgetary considerations and decisions must be made now to prepare for Clinton's future, particularly as it pertains to enrollment, facilities, and best practices surrounding the delivery of educational services? What does it cost to fund the priorities of the stakeholders of Clinton Public Schools? Marianne O'Donnell will walk you through our budgetary process and results on Thursday, but I would like to highlight a few things for you now. First, the budget supports the programmatic priorities of our district and community, including but not limited to a diverse offering of advanced placement classes at Morgan, an empowering athletics program at Elliott and Morgan, a K-12 world language program, which is realizing impressive accomplishments in our Morgan students, Project Adventure for third graders, nationally ranked invention convention participants at Pearson, and schools of distinction recognitions at Elliott and Joel, and award-winning staff like Joe Macrino at Joel. Second, as in recent years, the 2018-2019 budget co contains cuts to personnel, both certified and non-certified. With solemn and serious thought, the board recognizes that Clinton's demographics have changed, and the work of the district must evolve to reflect those changes. The current enrollment projections, as per NESDEC, which were compiled on November 7th of last year, indicate that we need to make some changes in staff allocation to better mirror the number of students we need to educate in each grade. <coughs> One step we are proposing to achieve this task is restructuring the team concept at Elliott in grade six. This move will impact our staffing levels, but it is appropriate in response to our enrollment. These were profoundly difficult decisions for the board to make, and we do not take this, this action lightly. Additionally, over the coming months, the board will be engaging in conversations that will center on um, the future use of, and functionality of the district's facilities and resources, to ensure that our work, while done in the best interest, best interest of our students, reflects Clinton's realities. Third, the budget reflects the district's commitment to negotiate costs for goods and services that are in the best interest of the stakeholders. In addition to the ongoing participation in the healthcare collaborative, the district has gone out to bid on services such as transportation. Transportation represents a major budget driver one that the district is statutorily required to provide to every student in the district, and it would be fiscally irresponsible not to require competitive bids for that service. The board unanimously approved this budget on February 5th. It represents thoughtful, often challenging consideration of the district's goals and needs. It reflects what it costs to operate a school district. It cuts staff and programming where it is prudent to do so while maintaining the priorities of the district, 
It sets the stage for the evolution of the district as it continues to adapt to the evolution of the town. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you. I look forward to the conversation going forward as the boards, stakeholders, and taxpayers work toward the balance, toward the balance of Clinton's budgetary priorities. Thank you. Thank you. The, the presentation will be made to us on Thursday. If anyone you know, has questions, they, they can pick up the cell phone number, communicate by email, and thank you for uh, being here tonight, Ellen. And, uh, Eric. Let me know. You guys are getting me. All right. We're on to uh, fire department, right? 13, is that where we're at? Yeah. So we've been kind of saying, you know, make your pitch, and it never seems to be short of questions we have. So I came in at uh, almost a zero percent increase with the exception of a small increase for my administrative staff under salaries and an increase in utilities, which was uh, reduced by the Board of Selectmen at our last meeting. So I would respectfully ask that the Board of Finance reinstate that $6,000. Uh, that cost is for uh, mobile, data, mobile data terminal connection in the fire apparatus to the new dispatch software. It's something that we've been waiting for for a period of time. Uh, I'm doing my best to absorb the first four to five months of this year out of my current utility budget, and that's why we budgeted for it in the following year. This is something that a lot of places have had for well over 10 years, including uh, in Chief DeMeo's cruisers. So. It gets the information out in the field a lot better than it has been for a long time. The hope is that we'll have some connectivity into information that's part of document management and in the GIS once all the layers are put together and all the systems talk to each other. And as far as repair and maintenance, general supplies and other operating, uh, those have not changed since last year. So basically, it's a it's a Verizon internet connection, and each vehicle has some associated monthly cost. That's it. That's it. No. It's an iPad mounted in the truck that talks just like back and forth. Does all your mapping, all your moving. Is because you said that's why the costs are going up because of that. they did a, a certain amount for each budget and I didn't get the previous notice as to what the cup was going to be so I had to make a decision the night of the meeting as to which of the six nine items to take the money from. I was asked for $6,000 so I took it out of where I put the increase. So you were asked to take it out and you're not sure you're asked to put it back, right? Correct. Can you explain that? You have a pretty large number under other, what was the, yeah. Other operating? Yeah. Uh, Mary, do they all have the backup? Sure. Basically covers everything that we do that's outside of repairs and maintenance, which is relatively self-explanatory. So all of our physicals, uh, all the psychological testing, any insurances all the training, all the training supplies, any equipment that uh, would be a new purchase, fire prevention, it's all in one. Basically, you see it as, or the town sees it as one line item. We break them out internally because they're assigned to individual people to manage. Correct, so there was a, a line for special town events that Fireworks is the big one. Also, if we have to open the EOC and force somebody to be there, or if another event comes up that we have that we are mandated to staff, uh, that line item was removed and moved into some other line that the Board of Selectmen created. I'm 
sorry, the fireworks. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not saying that. Here. That's on down the bottom. Yeah. Special yeah. ones. They requested no, five thousand to zero it out. Right. It was moved. Uh, and that's what was moved, I believe, to that. Is that what was moved to that that line? There was a chamber of commerce line. Is that what that is? It's um, so all uh, event type donations have been moved into the um, uh, other government, other general government under donations. So this would be also any type of event that would require um, police assistance, which falls out of the regular operating budget. And that's contractual. It gives us more transparency, I assume. Otherwise, everybody's got different line items, special events, whatever it's in there, and it's harder for us to figure. At this point, we're going to see, you know, who's, you know, there might be multiple uh, expenditures on, on uh, special events. I guess you know, we've got fire, police, you know, we've got the harbor commission, we've got this, that, the other thing. So uh, that's that's an expenditure that we would have to. Approved in, in a different line. One of the questions I have is about some of these events. You know, my understanding is that if it's a town event, there is a cost attached to that. If it's not a town event, there's a cost plus something attached to it. Does it cost the town any more to provide those services to a third party than to do it itself? And is there some reason why there's an extra charge? So I, I can't speak for police or for public right, works. Time if I can tell you on the fire department side, it is the same rate no matter who it is. Okay. So that, that misinformation has been going around, and I only heard it through, through third parties. Nobody has directly asked me, but I can assure you that the rate is the same, and it was set based on the going rate that all the other volunteer fire departments use for their events. So whether it be some private entity doing something, or whether we as a town do something, it's going to cost us that much money. Same rate. But in the case of the fireworks, it's a chamber event, correct? Rather than a town. The other simple events where we provide an ambulance to all those other things, we absorb that cost and have since day one. Third. How much longer we can absorb that, I don't know. Well, you see, we won't get into the. There's a reason for, let's say, the police, because of if you're providing something to the town, it's a town. If you're providing something to the to a private vendor, obviously, you know, we're not in the business of underwriting, you know, what we would spend on ourselves as a town. So, I mean, we'll leave that for the to Right. Explain that. Now, I've been ex exchanging some emails regarding the LOSAP program, and one of my questions is, you have a number of, uh, of people that are on your uh, abatement list uh, who are over 65 and who I think qualify uh, for the defined uh, benefit program. Do they uh, qualify for both at the same time? Can does somebody get a defined benefit and get a um, a tax abatement? Yes, <clears throat> I think I explained in one of the emails that speak up, please. Both federal and state guidelines uh, allow for both a LOSAP payment and a tax abatement payment. So there's no, nothing in there that is prohibitive as far as those two things are concerned. So the answer is yes, they do get both. They do get both. Okay, that's right. And Why then, do they remain active? Well, they remain active. Um, for the tax abatement. And, and, and then to qualify, is there any, any dispensation for older participants? Do they have to uh, meet all the same requirements that a 30-year-old does if they're 65 mm -hmm. or 70? That's, a, that's impressive. <laughs> you, I, I think there was a question about uh, somewhere along the line about one of our members being 85 years old and joining the department at age 79. Right. Let me tell you something. If I'm as healthy as this guy and as active as him, when I get 85, I'll be very, very happy. I, I did a traffic detail with him in an accident one time. He just finished walking two miles. He spent four hours out in the road in the cold uh, redirecting traffic. So, it, you know, it's, yeah, these us old guys can do some stuff. It's just when I looked at the number, I thought maybe there was somebody else 
by the same name living in the same place. No, he went just hadn't been. Yeah. Okay. It's impressive. Yeah. Couple couple of questions. I mean, what's what's the age you have to retain before you get the defined benefit? You have to. Well, first of all, there's only a certain group of people that will ever get the. Defined I, I understand all that. Okay. okay. That the past service. You have to reach age 65, okay. and you have to have completed 20 years of service. 65 and 20. So no one would be able to get both unless they're 65 years old because they right. wouldn't be able to collect. That's number one, and 20 years of service. Uh, the other question I have on the program is on the defined contribution. Um, you know, we, the town picks up all, you know, the fees. Uh, question I have is, do the fee, do the defined contributions, when, when someone leaves the town or no longer lives here, you know, they can take their money or can they take their money after a certain period of time and move it into another investment? No, in the defined contribution, uh, it's actually our obligation to, uh, if somebody has completed their 20 years of service and they've moved out of town, they've been out of town for 10 years, we have to find that person and get I'm talking about contribution, not, not the benefit. What I'm talking about is those, I understand that. So right now we have a young, new, new hire, uh, or new volunteer. Okay. So what you end up with is uh, they get X amount and a defined contribution goes into account. Okay, that's a 457. Right. How long is that, how long is it before they can opt to take that and put it into another qualified fund? They have to be five years. Five years. It doesn't have to be five consecutive years, but it has to be five years. So the money has to be in there five years. That's correct. So because the thing is, you can never bring your cost down of managing a fund if you continue to pull out. I, you know, I don't know why, why don't we come up with five years? Because I would understand if somebody's leaving or whatever it might be, why manage it for five and, and why not manage it for two? I mean, it's, it's kind of the rules were, I wonder well, how the they rule, the rules were, were designed uh, specifically to try and encourage our new members that are coming in to at least give us that five-year commitment in order to became, become eligible for their, their benefit to be theirs, if I explain that correctly. Well, we, want, we wanted to ensure, it, you know, it's a, we wanted to ensure that not only is it a recruitment uh, benefit, but it's also a retention benefit, and we didn't want them coming in putting two years in, getting $2,000 from the town, and then turning around and walking away and taking So really it's a five-year vesting is what you're right. looking That's for. correct. You're looking at a return on your investment because what we found statistically is if a member makes it to the five to seven year mark, they generally continue the career path until wherever it goes. But also with the five-year vesting, the amount of money that the town is going to expend to get that person up to speed and equip the person, at least if they make it to that five year mark to, to get vested, it's kind of, you start to get in, that, in that wash, absence, you know what I mean? In the absence, well, all of this is very interesting, but we're not here to discuss your, your pension plans. We're here to approve or listen to your budget requests. I 100% agree with this. And there's nothing interesting. in here regarding pensions. Well, there's a quote, well, there's a quote. well, I think there is, I think one of the questions I had is is there particularly on the defined uh, benefit is your annual required contribution and where is that i mean what is okay, the here's what happens Kurt. Uh, i'm not an actual but hooker and holcomb has i think forwarded information to the town i think it was last year i think for the next three or four years the amount for the defined benefit is a hundred and seven thousand or uh, how they arrive at those numbers, how that money is dispersed, I don't know. But that John Fuller, who I coded in on that email today to you, mm -hmm. could explain that a lot better than I would. And, um, I, and what's a, do we have a, an established liability of what that, what the liability and, and is? This, this, this turned out to be kind of a peculiar thing, because when we first started out, uh, we had uh, an actuary has come up with a defined benefit plan for the entire department, and the liability on that was minimal. Which and what? It, we just 
you know, we just pushed it by the wayside. With the way this plan is set up, uh, if I die tomorrow, that money just disappears. It, 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 so I think what they're doing is, actuarially, they're saying, okay, well, if the town gives us this much money each year, we have enough money and some money left over to be able to disperse the funds to the uh, defined benefit people. And I, I think they're kind of playing it really close to the best there. They're not extent, it's, it's kind of a crazy program because there's no pick that. I would have picked the $1,000 a year plan because it would have given me a greater return on my investment if I stayed for 20, 25 years. So I, we'll have to chalk the drawing. We have 16 other agencies to review tonight. Alright, I'm, I'm just I would like, I would like to move it along. Don't ask the question. There's nothing in our program here dealing with income. But somebody's yeah. asking the question. Don't ask the question. Well, if you don't, if you want to ask the question, put it on an agenda item for the Board of Finance. Right. Well, we can ask the question because there is an expenditure for the defined benefit plan because we have to fund it. That. Well, and that's not, that, you know what that number is? You know what that number is? I don't remember. Okay, well that's enough. To you? It's 108,000. Okay, 108,000. So that's what we're talking about numbers. I mean, there's numbers that are there. But and, not and in this budget. But no, no, we, no. Never, we never really had a good discussion on this one. I, you know, my feelings were is that there's some questions just need to be cleared. We can clear them. Some of them have been cleared up already. Uh, one thing I just look for, one thing that stuck for me though is that I, in a document here it says that there is no other volunteer fire department that doesn't have a hundred percent of the fine said in the area benefit, benefit benefit well what is the area I guess that's all you're talking Madison you're talking Westbrook Old Saybrook Essex uh, Deep River Chester Deep River Chester, River, Chester. Uh, Old Saybrook uh, they get eight hundred dollars a month they have an early retirement provision yeah. and they have that's a uh, survival benefit there all of these other departments have had a LOSAP program since 1989 to 1991. Well, we, we, we can go into the numbers where they come into the light. Yeah, I, I always saw it as, I didn't see this as like work, survivors, benefits, all this other stuff. It's, it's a stipend to turn around and, and make sure we keep the quality <coughs> to keep people here and attract people there. There's also, you know, we can compare right. that's, that's, that's correct. But, but it wasn't, just so we understand though, that, you know, my feelings were is that we want things bid. We want the, the money manager's bid. The, the, the cost of the money manager on a, on a defined contribution is a bit high because it's just going to be put into, you know, pretty simple investments. So $750, I mean, uh, that's for just that, that piece there. And then, but they're there for five, so we know that. And then the best, and then after that, I mean, if you don't, if you don't stay at five, I guess you get the money at 59. Mm -hmm. Can I make a motion? If you don't, if you don't say, it's not a meeting, it's a budget meeting. So. Can I make a motion? So well, you, you can make a suggestion, and I'll make a suggestion that when you want to ask questions for 10 minutes, we'll have somebody else make that same recommendation. That's all. Okay? I would like to make a motion so we can There's get no on it's, not, it's not a meeting. You can make a suggestion. You want to make so a suggestion? Let me suggest that we accept the 334,090, which increases. The Board of Selectmen's recommendation by the 6,000 that the fire department that's not, is looking for. That's not before us. That's not before us tonight. We're having a budget workshop. Fine. So your suggestion, your suggestion is you heard enough on this. Anybody else have any other questions? We don't have to vote on it. But again, I'll say this. When you feel you need 15 minutes, mm -hmm. then, then people who feel that they don't want to have your time. They can leave. Right. You know, well, they said the same thing to you. They do. And they can. And I will, Mr. Chairman. I think. I think we've got enough answered on this for tonight. Right. But I would like them to come back and answer some more of these questions. We can. They you guys have got my email. Okay. Please feel free. Um, I'll give you my phone number okay. at, the, at the end of the meeting. Right. And, and just feel free to contact right. us. Right. I want to put your 6,000 back. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.
fine with the Board of Selectmen recommendations. There's nobody here to answer questions, but except if you have any. Do you think we could just move the library to next? They don't have to wait to I'm looking at your suggestion. Oh, Very I'm, we're here to the end. It's kind of like, yeah. as long as there's no objections from everybody else. Yeah. The library is always last. I think it's good. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, what's happened there? That's the last one. The last one. Always in Stay at 746 for this year again. Um, the cuts would probably come from our materials budget. Um, we've had, as you can see, our the, the, the funding that we request doesn't even cover our operating expenses. We do uh, have some income um, from our trust. We have some state grants that fluctuate from year to year. Um, we've done some fundraising, which we always do once a year with our book fund drive. That seems to be pretty steady. Um, but uh, we're expecting, it might be pie in the sky, but we're expecting more money from the state this year. I mean, next year, I'm sorry, than we are um, expecting this year. We promised. I'm sorry? In 2019? Yes. 1819. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Email me your latest financials. I think. Um, yes, I think <coughs> you should have a copy. <coughs> we yeah. sent them over to yeah the finance yep. department. Yeah. 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 $75,000 for overtime. 
on a $324,000 salary line is out of whack, but that's not a three-year average. A three-year average is actually $94,000. Every year staffed uh, around the clock, it's a 24-7 operation. Every time that someone takes time off, it requires an overtime hire, and there are also 20 open shifts per month when no one takes off. So um, the staffing model that's being utilized is, is, is really hurting the town, and that's a number that uh, really needs to be taken under control. So their contract is due uh, June 30th, it expires. Um, we're looking at a number of options to hopefully stabilize this platform, control overtime costs, deliver services through regionalization. Do the best I can. Uh, Seventy-five thousand dollars. If it stays as is, if staffing uh, stays as is, I don't honestly think I can achieve that. But I'll do the best that I can. So, the, when is the contract expire? June thirtieth. So, the problem with that is, is I doubt very much that we'll have an agreement by June thirtieth, right? I've already broached the uh, subject with them. They, I, I've already expressed my concern to the union president. Uh, the <coughs> president. Uh, I've also broached the idea of possible regionalization. They're the same union as Madison, uh, so they're rep both represented by EPSU. Uh, Madison has it in their contract now. It uh, was just negotiated last year. If the uh, possibility for regionalization arises, that they have to uh, allow that. So. A lot of the legwork has already been done, and even though we, we may not have a deal done by July 1st, I think we're moving in a good direction. I uh, hope to meet at some point uh, with the approval of the Board of Selectmen and the First Selectmen's Office to discuss, to discuss it further with Madison and possibly with OPM, because if we get designated as a regional, uh, we do have the ability to get some state funds coming in to supplant some of these costs. Because um, if you don't get the contract done, you're you know, with $75,000, you are uh, but we, we're hopeful. I mean, do you have any idea uh, if you negotiate the right kind of contract or regionalization that would bring that, would bring that number 94 down? Much, that's, that's an actual number. That's, an, that's a real three-year average, yes, sir, which is, represents 30%, which is just on our heads. You can't sustain that. It's, it's a staffing model. Because our other problem is the staffing need. model that should have been put in place, sir. And it's, it, I don't understand how it got in there, and it just creates a monster where you can't get out. I can't get out from under uh, until you renegotiate the contract. What I hope to do is that we can stabilize the platform by cross training with Madison, which would open up our pool. Everyone would still have home rule. We would still have dispatchers germane to each location. However, we'd be able to share a labor pool, we'd be able to look at call volumes and possibly less in staffing. There are less <coughs> call volume times to, to patch between. We've already uh, moved on to the Ridge Road facility. We moved our equipment uh, from the outside into a building that Madison built um, that was approved by the Board of Selectmen, so we moved that. We have the ability to get onto their communication system, and the positive about that is they've built their system to be the state on the state backbone. So the state backbone runs through Madison. It keeps overbuilt. So downstream, when we have to upgrade our communication system, if we have a regional operation, we can greatly reduce the cost of our radio systems. Have we notified the union that we're looking to sit down and no negotiate a new contract yet? I have made them aware of it, and we're probably looking to start hopefully in April. Can we do that formally? I have not done it formally yet, no. They're aware of it. I've also discussed it with the fire department because uh, this is a public safety platform. And I want to make sure that uh, we are meeting anything that we do decide uh, meets their needs. I don't want to uh, act arbitrarily to decide what happens best for police. Uh, they're a very big part of public service, and I meant to, need to make sure that they uh, are fully served as well. Chief, you had $34,000 in overtime uh, last year. This year you're running 34, 36 months. So a substantial improvement. Why don't you think they're trying to make you think? Well, 94,000 would be the projected for three-year average. And what happens is um, it, it's not broken out, sir, um, month per month. You can't equally space it out. What will happen is in June, uh, they're due a lot of payments. So the last payment of the, of the fiscal year before we start a new year 
turns out to be about thirty thousand dollars because everybody takes their accumulated time that they have for CDA. Um, so that number gets much higher at the last one. So really projecting a six month yeah, you can't you can't say okay at the six month point we're only halfway there. I wish we could, but unfortunately that last month is much higher than all the vacations. Uh, yeah, it's all it's all their accumulated payouts and they take all their time that they're gonna lose. So there, there's substantial amount of higher backs. This, this I, I assume it cost us and the average was driven up so high because we had a working comp case and that really drove our overtime. Well, they, it did drive it and I, I fixed that part of it, but still we we're suffering issues in that the way the staffing model is, it, it, it creates overtime. You can't well, get obviously, away from it. Obviously they see that, right? Well they, well, they know that, but the real, and I ran all the numbers because now I, when I finally got my software, my staffing software in place, I was able to pull this data out. And their use of sick time is very small. So all of the higher backs are for use of their accumulated time, which we have to grant them. Um, it's not, so there's not, it's not a disciplinary issue. I can't discipline somebody for taking too much sick time because the numbers are actually very, very low. And one dispatcher hasn't taken a single day since he went full time, not one single sick day. The highest one is about six in, in 16 months or 18 months. Well, it's all about negotiations because the model is just crazy because in order to try to manage and do this and with, with the system the way it is, it's your old time is just going to be out of control. Correct. Like I said, 30%. It, listen, any any 24-hour emergency staffing, we should be between a 10 and 15% window, and that's where you want to be because you can't get it much lower than that. So to be double that or three times that is just outrageous. And well, obviously, labor management relations and meetings and understanding and negotiating early would be a good idea because they want to come to this room and hear some of the people that think that we uh, don't need certain things uh, at some point. Uh, whether we approve, whatever we approve still has to go to the voters and has to be approved. So, well, and the other issue, sir, is that uh, nobody was really sure who negotiated this contract and there's, there's really very little understanding as to who is actually in charge of the communications operation. I'm in charge of their discipline by contract, but that's about one line in their CBA. There's really nothing else. I mean, I, I, I oversee them on a daily basis, but there's really no clearly defined authority. This is an orphan. Yes. Okay. <coughs> but we're bringing them into the fold. And they're willing to work with us. They're good people. Good to hear. Can I ask you? So you yep. basically, yeah. um, no, you basically only have like six full-time, two part-time, according to like the breakdown here. Correct. I used to live out of state, and I know in New York, they would have sometimes the police officers doing one communication. Is that something that, and I, 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 yeah, um, but in my old agency, we used to have a police officer sit uh, in communications. The problem with that is you, you, that's really kind of a waste of labor. I mean, it's very expensive to train an officer, keep them certified. So when we have a certified officer, we prefer that they're out on the street well, yeah, doing that their makes job. Sense. So, but just like to fill in, you know, when you need, instead of a well, you got jurisdictions, right? I, well, I have, they have to, we have to train them up, we've got to keep them certified. And the problem is, if they're only doing it on an ad hoc basis, you really kind of lose all the protocols, and, and we're dispatching for fire and EMS as well, so they have a set of protocols that they have to do. My police officers aren't going to fall into that very easily, so it's so not the contract, yeah, it's, the contract allows you to cross the train, and then you have the police contract also you have to deal with, correct? Right. But this communications is separate from the police contract. Yeah, but, but if you're going to cross train a police officer to do dispatch work, and that's what you're asking, right? Right. right. You got two contracts. Right. You got but in the old days, there was no yeah. communicators. They were all copies. That's right. And I think that's, that's where, where, that's where the branch went. Right. It used to always be you would call and you would have a desk sergeant or you right. would have somebody answering the phones, but then they realized it was really, it was far more uh, cost effective to have a civilian properly trained to do that because they don't need to do the law enforcement function. They do a very important function, but they don't have to have the law enforcement certifications. How, how many how many people are on duty? I mean, what's the minimum number, maximum number? We have two assigned for the day shift, two assigned for the 311 shift, and one for the overnight shift. Okay. And that adds up to... Okay. So it's two, two, and one? Correct. And that's something else I'd be looking to do, if possible, if we're able to staff, right now it's staff matching uh, the police ships. I mean, 
that if we can look at call volumes and understand call volumes, perhaps we can um, move staffing around to be more effective into high call volume times, have more dispatchers on in the late times, um, you know, where one could cover it, we'd help them be able to do that. And if we have the regionalization, we have the ability to have the two additional. So, do you do communications for police and fire? Or? All public safety communications. We are the PSAP for the town, so we call 911, it rings in our center, and we discern whether it's a medical, police, or fire emergency, and then do the dispatching. Um, so you can dispatch EMS or fire or police? Dispatch all police, fire, EMS, and police to get the 911s. Is there something in the contract that prevents us from hiring another full time? Does that work? We're looking at a bunch of options right now. Uh, we're, we're two part-timers down, and the problem with part-timers is they were, uh, I guess, to try and fill some of the gap of those 20 unmanned shifts per month. Uh, the problem is that it's in the contract that it's right of first refusal to my full-timers, number one. And number two is when you get a, when you get a part-timer on, they don't get a lot of hours, so they yeah, start doing a job they get a full-time job, they go yeah, for that. you got six full-timers. Are there any restrictions about having seven full back? You can have a million if you want. There's no restriction. There's no at restriction. At some point, you start to look at, you know, it's correct. It's cheaper. Correct. You know, then you eliminate some part time, right? Then you don't have. Are these uh, how many hours of part timers? They just fill in whenever they get a shift. So. So there's no benefit. There's no. There's no benefits. No. So the problem with that is we have to train them. They have to keep their certifications, and they're very short lived because. When they get the opportunity to go and get a full-time job at the dispatcher, they leave us. So don't look around. So there's a cost associated with that as well. <coughs> when is uh, when is this contract over? June 30th, sir. Of this year. <coughs> yes. So you negotiate the contract. Any other questions on our communication? Mm -hmm. None. The next. <coughs> budget. Um, we're very hard at trying to be innovative and, and, and control costs. I think uh, it's hard to believe, but I guess in April I'll be starting my third year of service to the town. I don't know where the time went, but here it is. Um, this budget represents a minor increase. It's 0.52% uh, over current fiscal year. We did move a couple items over to the DPW, so that adjusted um, increase would be 0.52%. 8.5%, so we're still below a 1% increase uh, on the overall budget. Again, the uh, Board of Selectmen uh, moved to reduce the overtime budget by 17000 and change. Um, I'm fine with that. I'll try and do the best I can to, uh, to keep those numbers where they are at 250000 We were short. We haven't seen that, actually. It, it, it's tight, but we have a couple things in the pipeline which may help me... Uh, address that and keep that figure where, where it says. <coughs> Questions? I'll ask you the same question, Mr. Mayor, now, Mr. that I asked them in the fire department yes. about does it cost any more to man something that's for the town than to staff something that's for the Chamber of Commerce or for some other sure. civic group? It's a little bit of a complex uh, situation, so let me try and explain it to you the best I can. Um, per the collective bargaining agreement, there are two separate rates that we charge for extra duty work. Now, if it's overtime work, that's things that we would do for normal purchase. Things for outside agencies like the Chamber of Commerce, that's an outside agency. So they are charged an outside duty rate. Same as, uh, you know, Eversource or the water company or anybody that are doing a extra duty road job for. Uh, if it's a town function, there is a lesser rate, uh, which the officers work extra duty work for. So if they're going to work a basketball game, if they're going to work a sporting event, something of that nature that's built at a lesser rate. Uh, the problem Christmas becomes. Like Christmas in Clinton? Christmas in Clinton is a Chamber of Commerce event, so that's built at the outside duty rate. So this is all contractual, this is all in the, in the, in the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, 
the issue that we have a little bit of a problem with is when we have a bunch of jobs that need to be staffed extra duty, all my officers, of course, sign for the outside duty ones, but they pay more. Um, so when you have that split between the town cost and, and the, uh, we have short staffing usually on the, on the town side jobs. So the, the differential is in what the officers are paying. Correct. So there is a real difference in the cost. But it's still outside billing. It's still paid by an outside entity. So except for like sporting events and things at the schools, but that's paid from the Board of Education budget. Right. So if, I mean, it's still in the same pocket. If, if, if I'm correct, do they, they don't get any pension credits on what they work on the outside job, correct? So they're looking to make more money because the benefit is not being paid for them by the town. That's if right. I'm working on a town project, they're paying my pension. So therefore, what you're doing is you're just making, I don't know exactly, but it's kind of like making them whole because he's not getting overtime credit here. The reason we don't do the overtime credit there is because we want that as a town and not have to have that expense going under pension. Correct. Also, the, the thing for us is what we're, we're paying ourselves. So if we're doing something for ourselves, it, 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 you take out of one pocket, put in the other, it doesn't matter. Whereas Eversource or any other private entity, we want to make sure we're getting our full reimbursement for cost. And I don't even know if we're doing that. But full, because when you add all the other things in, administrative, the car, wear, tear. Well, we charge $15 an hour for use of the car when right. those are out. And then we so, also charge a 15% administrative fee to cover the billing and, and extra duty. But I want to make sure that everybody thinks that, well, there's a bonus here. Uh, for the cops because they're working private. No, they're not getting their overtime. And uh, I don't know if there's anything that has anything to do with banking hours or anything on, you know, the uh, health savings account. I don't know. But that's a that's a fresh reason why they get more, I think. So when they're working outside, that, that doesn't count toward their pension. When they're working for something internal, that does count toward their pension. If it's overtime, if it's actual overtime, and the distinction that needs to be made is overtime versus extra duty work. So any kind of extra duty work, whether it's for a town entity like a, a basketball game um, or some other town function that the town is going to be billed the extra duty rate, which is a reduced extra duty rate, or a private duty job, which is Eversource, Chamber of Commerce, whoever. That's extra duty billing. That not, doesn't count towards their pension. The only thing that would count toward their pension is overtime, i.e., if we're working a late late call, if they're doing an investigation, they get held over for an additional shift, if I have to send them to training on a day off, those types of things. So that's the distinction. Where's our contract then? Our contract? We're, we're, we are waiting for a, a vote, a TA. We have, we have a tentative agreement in place. When was uh, it over? April? It's already, it's been expired for two years, so we're, uh, <laughs> the contract's been expired yes, for two years. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, we do have a, we, we have a TA with the town. My understanding is that we are just waiting for the town to present the insurance, because it'll be a change of insurance. They need to present that to the union. The union will then have a ratification vote, and then it'll come back to the board of selectmen for their ratification vote. We do have a tentative agreement in place. That tentative agreement, I presume, is retroactive or has it? Can't say. Um, uh, it's still. It, okay. It's still. Yes. I, I can't say. Unfortunately. The the overtime. You know. I see. It's it's been cut. And. You know. I I realize there's been some circumstances that have driven overtime up. Some things have become less of a burden on us. And I'm hoping that we see some opportunity to to bring the overtime. You know, down substantially more. And, you know, I think that, that becomes uh, a concern uh, that I have on, on the overtime. And, and I, I fully agree with you, sir. And that's everybody, whenever we talk emergency services, the, the hot button issue is always going to come to overtime. Um, I will do my best to maintain it, but there has to be an understanding that when you staff a 24-7 operation in emergency services, it, it is part of, it's part of operations. We can't eliminate it. Um, I'll try and control it as best I can, and the things that I have done to control that is to take care of all our injury leaves and all the people that have been out. Um, I currently have all my sworn officers back to work. When I came here two years ago, I had seven people out on injury leave, uh, and you can direct, you can talk to Karma, and they will tell you that I have cleaned it up, and we are in a far better position now. We don't have we don't see the, the missing time that we had, so that was a huge that was a huge driver for cost. 
and we have that under control. Everybody understands that I run a fake ship, and if you want to get back to work, I will help you navigate the system, but if you're trying to beat the system, we're going to separate. Well, we're cooperating and giving all the tools, I think, that, you know, uh, want to make sure that, you know, we can work towards that, because, again, when you go to the public, I mean, it's, it's one thing, is you're here for us, but, you know, the public just has a feeling, they look at it, and they say, well, why can't you do something about overtime, you know, you, you know, the same complaints you always get. And I understand that, sir, and I think at $250,000, I am a full $120,000 under where I was four years ago, so I've never even had the money that my predecessors have had, and that's real money. Uh, so we're, we're keeping a tight lid on it, we're running a tight ship, um, and we'll, we'll try and control it as best we can. But I believe you, we're given tools too, right? So. We are, we are given tools, and, you know, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that's going to help me. Thank you. Can you tell us about life duty? Do you have many officers who are in life duty because of injuries? I do not have light duty per se. Um, I've, I've granted occasionally on very short windows. Um, I don't like to do more than a couple of weeks because what happens is when you start granting officers light duty, they may be doing it a month, two months, three months, and you're paying them, and then now you've established a practice. So somebody else comes in and says, hey, well, you know, I, I, I'm her, why can't I do it? Then you have everybody, uh, you have the rubber gun squad, you have a bunch of people that aren't working, uh, and I'm paying to fill all these spots. So my job is to get them back to full duty status as fast as I can. I'll do a couple of weeks as almost a transition if they're out for an extended period of time so I can get their certifications back up. I can get them requalified in the range. I can make sure that all their qualifications are done and I get them reoriented. But I don't like to do it for more than that. So when currently we have no one. Currently I have, ever, I have all my all my sworn officers are back full duty. Small department. You got it's hard. It's uh, you know all the dispatchers used to be what you call light duty. So I mean. Well, but there's, there's, it's so, it's so, the, the operation is, you really don't, you know, you're, even if you try to find something like to me, what's there? Well, and, and again, and that's, and that's really the whole problem. There. You can't have late duty because the job description doesn't really right, fit right. that. Um, some, if your investigators go out, you can have them do some late duty work. That's a little bit easier. But as far as patrol work is concerned, patrol work is physical work. And you have to have the ability to perform. Well, once you put somebody on the street, they're... They're on the street, yeah, no correct. matter what you're doing. Correct. If they're sitting in the office processing papers, that's like duty, but we don't have correct. Yeah, you know, and listen, we're a small department. When, when, things, yeah, I, when things go haywire, everybody grabs a rifle and gets in the street. Yeah. I just have a question. Two quick questions. Yes. Um, on the Marine support, you, your costs went up to so like 70%. Correct. Did you just have one vote, or why did the cost increase so much? Because the, uh, the, the previous budgeting for that was just an, an unreal number. It was only $5,000, which basically was enough to put the boat in in the spring and pull the boat out at the end of the season. Didn't really account for true operations. Uh, and that's an important service area for us. We have a large summer population. We have a large uh, marina population. And, and, you know, the only thing that they really see for their dollars is that marine patrol. Um, so what size boat is it? What size? Right now it's a 25-foot Almar, which I'm trying to replace, and we'll get to that for CDC. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> the other quick question I have. Would you like to talk about it now? I mean, it's just as good now, right? If you don't mind. Yeah, capital is coming up. Right. Check. Um, the other quick question was on the canine program. Yes. How many dogs do One. you have? One. One dog. Yes. And the majority of that is all. He doesn't have a vest, though. No, he, he does have a vest. He's donated. donated. He's donated. Yeah. So okay. the majority of all the funds that come for uh, expenses of that program are privately funded. So no, a very small, expensive. very small line item for that. So we just had a full um, ballistic and stab proof vest donated for him. We had a full bite suit donated. Uh, he brings in a lot of money. Tell him I'd like to share a meal with him. Sometime. Exactly. He's, <laughs> <not done. laughs> He's all right. He's our, best in He's our best ambassador, I'll tell you that. He has, he has 9,000 Instagram followers all around the world. Wow. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? Now, animal control. Correct. Okay, so animal control, again, um, it's become a little bit of an area of concern for me. Uh, trying to keep this properly staffed. And again, this contract expires on the 30th. She's under the same contract as my district. Correct. 
So I think we have, right now we currently share the animal control facility. It is a multi-municipality. It's us, Madison, and Westbrook share that facility. Uh, I don't see there's any reason since we share the facility that we can't share services as well. And again, try and stabilize this platform. Right now my full-time um, animal control officer has been out. She's been out hurt for two months. Uh, and I'm perfectly honest, I'm killing my part-timer. He's 75 years old, and every day he sees me, he looks at me and goes, please, chief, help, help. I can't, I can't survive this. So I think when we talk about the, when we talk about the regionalization process for uh, communications, I think it's already a natural fit for us to talk about stabilizing the platform um, for animal control as well. It allows, again, each, everyone will maintain home rule, We'll be able to cross train and spread services so we can extend service hours for our animal control officers. Right now, she works 8 to 4, Madison works 8 to 4. We can just split up or say ours works 7 to 3 and theirs works 3 to 11. Now we have we have an animal control officer available for that whole two shift period for the majority of all animal calls, which allows us to keep our sworn officers out doing their patrol duties rather than taking dogs to the pound, picking people up, making them, releasing them. And it allows us to concentrate our operations where they belong. So patrol operations are done by law enforcement officers and the animal patrol function is handled by the animal patrol officer. I think it is. I think a lot of times you'll see there's a lot of bristling by uh, some of my fellow chiefs. They don't like that. They want to have their they want to have their little feet on. Uh, I think we have developed very strong relationships with Madison Police Department right now, and I think we do things for what they are. Um, the state is in serious financial trouble. Uh, we need to deliver public safety, and we need to look at platforms on a regional basis, just the same way um, many school districts provide. Uh, they have, have regionals. We can do these things. We're already doing many of these things already. We already have a number of uh, regional uh, projects in the works. So. I think we're trying to be on the leading edge of this, um, save the towns of money, uh, both towns of money, expand our operational platform so we stabilize them so we can reduce our exposure to overtime and, and other cost items. And this way we can also get some money flowing in from the state because once we put a regional operation together, OPM opens up the uh, opens up the faucet and get a little bit of state funding. Yeah, they can be incentive for region. Regionalization. So if we can look at, uh, we have three towns, can we look at, I don't know how many are in the health district, Westbrook didn't go in the health district, but can we look at Old St. Brook and uh, you know, Killingworth? We can certainly look at Killingworth. I think we can look to, to Westbrook. Uh, uh, what's we get in right now? Just right now for the animal control facility, it's Westbrook, us, and Madison. Right. So, Killingworth. so Killingworth would be a natural fit for us today? It doesn't matter that Madison's a different county. No, and as a matter of fact, we we have a regional uh, technical investigations crime squad, which is made up of three different regions, and, and our state's attorney, Mr. McShane, and Mr. Patrick Dillon in, in New Haven County love the fact that we work together, um, and it's been working very well for us jurisdictionally. You want to prove what you have and bring some more in and hopefully give us better coverage. Here. Again, listen, we're, we're trying to stabilize. I mean, it, it, I don't, I don't want to sit here and tell you we're going to save millions of dollars because we're not. But if we can stabilize where we're at, save some money, and then expose ourselves to overtime and, and other associated costs by defraying it out through the regionalization process, I think it, it's a real solid direction for us to move. And the one person's been out, what, a couple of, a couple of months? She's been out two months, correct. And she wanted to come back by duty, but I told her it was only duty for three months. So. There's duty and stable. Correct. So, um, I'm, I'm working on that, and I stay on top of that. I'm in constant contact with, with, with our current provider um, and help her through the process and, and staying in touch with them. So nobody gets nobody gets lost. I keep an eye on the watch. That's the same contract. Uh, same contract as yes, the, yes, yes, sir. And it's the same, and that's the same union that Madison has. So like you said, we've already a lot of the legwork's already been done for us because they, they're represented by the same union. Uh, and all this is fresh and recent. Which so union is that? It's easy. UPSU. Um, the right. Public Service Employees Union. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So I would, uh, I would, I'm, I'm happy with the board of selectmen's recommendation.
days while I'm not happy like well. I'm accepting of it. <laughs> I, will do, well, I will do the best I can to uh, to keep those numbers where they are. So I'm, I'm not going to ask for anything different. Um, the board of selectmen's recommendation is fine. Do you think there'll be pressure on the police department to improve protection of schools? It's always it's always an issue, and especially when whenever we have one of these shootings, there is always a uh, flare up of that. Um, we work very closely with, with Mary Ann and the school district. Uh, and I think we're, 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 in a good, we're in good shape. I don't like to talk procedures about any of that stuff because I think it gives away part of our response capability and it's uh, improper for us to do so. But I'm very confident where we sit right now uh, in our ability to protect our students and faculty at each one of our facilities. My officers are in the building. So no growth there in, in the resource officer area. I mean, I'd love to have one. I'd love to have one in every school, but obviously that's a true cost that uh, at this point I know we can't afford, so that's, you know, that's... Well, it could get mandated. The yeah. state likes to mandate things. Well, the state is going to mandate, I think, the next mandate you're going to see is they're already discussing uh, at least Tier 1 state accreditation for everybody, so that's something that... Um, tier 1 accreditation yes. for everyone? For everyone. And that's going to be unfunded. That's going to be an unfunded mandate. But that's coming down the pike. And I, I, I won't doubt if you don't see it this next legislative session. What is that? What is that? Uh, basically, the accreditation process is there's, well, the, the national one is COLEA. Uh, and it's a set of standards, uh, best practices, and addresses every area of police administration and operations uh, and requires to meet the standard. Um, the states uh, kind of stole the COLEA model, basically, and just made it uh, to their own. Uh, and tier one is the entry level, and it addresses all your high liability, low occurrence issues. You have to have a pursuit policy, internal affairs policy, promotion policy, sexual harassment, um, use of force. Those types of major policies need to be in place and meet the standard. Um, I would prefer that we would just go for the CALEA model. Um, I've been a CALEA assessor for nearly 15 years, uh, and I think it's the truest way to have an accountable agency moving forward uh, towards best practices. And it doesn't matter if you're a three-person agency or a 500-person agency. It's so, all... So is there a bill in up there now that you're going to go up and testify on? Or what do you no, do well, actually, yeah, I, I sit on the, I sit on the, uh, the Law Enforcement Advisory Council for Karma, and that meets on Thursday, and we are having, actually, to bring Kalia in because Karma now is backing the idea of a minimal accreditation for every department. Um, in the state, and that's also getting, it's getting a lot of push from the Post Council as well. And then CPCA is behind that also. So I don't see that it's going to be very far downstream. It's going to happen, it's just a matter of when. I'm, I'm thinking it's probably going to happen in 2018, is my guess. Uh, they're going to mandate it, we'll have to be all accredited by 2020 or whenever they decide to put the date down. And about <coughs> how much would that cost per officer? The, thousand? No, nah, well, I, I'd say you know, per officer costs aren't going to be big. It's just going to be the administration of it and putting the uh, putting it into place. So it's it's hard to put a price tag on it. Not a huge expense. No, not, it's 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 nominal, and, and it's it's needed to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, we need to have um, okay. because the backside of it is if you don't have a policy and then we're sued, we're already on our heels and we're not going to be able to function. You know, we're not going to be able to defend ourselves if the, and the checks get real big. Okay. I don't think he can answer it. Um, Go ahead. Are there cameras like this this last shooting where the kid walked onto campus and yes. no one saw him? Yep. We have we have cameras that are available. Um, we can see those in dispatch. Uh, the problem we had in this situation is that, you know, no one's gonna pick that kid out on, on a video. And then the real problem is that Wait, one of the students okay. let him in the building. So there was that's where the protocol breach occurred. So that, that's what we have to reinforce, uh, and I talked to Carrie uh, when we did Chasing the Dragon last week, and we talked specifically about that. And, and she reinforced it with her students that, listen, we have these protocols for a reason. Don't let people in. Yeah. You can't let them come to the door and just open the door and let them in. Um, so Especially if they're carrying something. They keep me out. <laughs> So, uh, zero it, tolerance. It's, uh, listen, it's, it's a scary situation. It's a huge issue, and, and there's no there's no easy answers. Uh, yeah. It's a very difficult situation. We've built yeah, a society. We, we, we're responsible. For it. We're we're responsible for the society. And we've made it, and now we're I think the kids with it. Are make so, so. Yeah. any other questions? 
Very done. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was much more pleasant than my last uh, year's trip. Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be tough. Yeah. <laughs> no. So we'll prepare. Who's got that book? Make it. Nobody's. Nobody's. It's. We don't have the green. Do you want us? Just, I can, Chief, just point out, we don't have a director at the moment. Um, we have a job description written that's going to go up on the town. Is that on the town website already? Right? No, not yet. We're reviewing it, and um, it, it, the role is fairly substantial for what it is, um, and we're having discussions about what similar municipalities are doing for that role. Um, but we're having conversations. Do, do union contracts allow us to take a look at how we might be, or is there any state statutes that prevent us from using current employees maybe to fill some of these positions? I, I would say off the hand at the moment, I don't know. Well, I mean, you, can, you can have whoever you want to do it. It's just a matter of you have to have someone that's available to do all the legwork. You can't have really an operational commander do it because a lot of this stuff is compliance work. It's time consuming, so that's why you need to have a separate director. Was that Clados? It was. Yeah. He resigned. There's also some training components so he, to it. He, he was a dispatcher, right? He still is. He's a dispatcher, correct? He's the union president. <laughs> it's a thankless job for the amount of money that's yeah. attached to it. It's not that simple. <laughs> I'll be happy to share with you the job description so you can see the amount of work that's required. I mean, we're required to have folks. Correct. Is there any kind of uh, penalties that it sits vacant for a period of time? Or what is, well, it's, it becomes problematic in a state of emergency because that person takes over. Um, and that person is actually communicating at the federal level, the state level, um, and without having that person in place. Um, we might not get the services that we need in an emergency, so we do need to get our telephone. Well, if someone someone needs to kind of review, especially based on if we're talking about bankless and no one wants a job or whatever else is there. Uh, you know, yeah, there. This is that. <laughs> the uh, in fact, this is. I'm not. I don't it's know, a stipend. I'm uncivil preparedness, okay? <laughs> my, my. Would that be fair? Uncivil? We, 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 did, we did all get together and be at Hal, remember when Matt Kent was the. Were you here then? Hal? Matt Kent was the civil defense lawyer. Yeah, the bomb shelter in his backyard. He did. He did. He did. He did. And then there's the 5,000 for the. That's the same position, deputy. Is it, was that the same position or was it two positions? Deputy Director of Shelter. That's the position. That's, that's the position. That's the same, but it's a separate 5000 so it's $10,000. No, it's only $5,000. No, the salary's at the bottom. It goes to the top. No. Okay, got it. Also, right. I okay. just point out there's a grant for reimbursement uh, for this as well. So it's $4,500. Um, I don't know if it's come up yearly, if it typically has come up. Every year? I'm not sure. Chief knows or. Yeah, full time. There's a recommendation for what the budget is to we'll look at it for July. What do we got next? What are you? Is water, you got water on there? Mm -hmm. Still working. Is this, is this the. Uh, yes. We, we got some inserts here for our. I think the water has set this. Yeah. Charges. Sure says screw it. I mean, there's there's not much we can do. Uh, you know, there's a process here. I guess you could go if anyone felt the charges are excessive or unfair, uh, you have to go up to the Pure Herrings. I guess you're considered part of the public at that point. Do they have, do they have the public agencies uh, given the opportunity to come and speak before Procure? Uh, sort of I have to vote that? I would think. The only thing is at some point, I mean, I guess we're paying less than some, maybe more than others. 
Did you, I don't know if you received the report as well? Yeah. Oh, no, that's separate. So that, that's a letter from Connecticut Water, which we asked for their update. Um, there's another report that was provided to you via one of the staff. And um, it indicates the rates that the surrounding towns or other municipalities are paying. Higher? Are they higher than ours? Okay, we'll get you that. We'll get you that document. So we don't have that yet? Or it's, it's in our mail. Okay, so we'll be here Thursday. Well, again, I mean, it's, it's um, the rates have been set for how long and we're, you know, it's not much other than looking in the future, see what we can do. I mean, I think it's a, a slip. Well, we're going to have 20, 30, Rocky, Rocky, Rocky. Yeah. Well, that's another discussion. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to talk about that? No. I do. I know. Kurt wants to talk about that pension. So what do you got against water pipes and pension? Anything? No, All right. Let's do it at 20 minutes. Street light. Street light? Street light. Save money. Right? They want the little sneakers around. The, uh, so now all year round we use through the center of the town, the lower lights, the upper lights are shut off, right? If That's you want, not reflected in this. That will reflect next year. That's the savings, right? No. No. There are. Well, if you have them on, so if you, whether you have them on or not, you're paying for That's correct, as long as the fixtures are up in the air. They were shut off as an experiment to see if anybody would notice the difference between them being on and on. It was, it was a nice experience. And then once we can remove them, we can then take them off the inventory with whatever source. Okay, because truthfully, it, 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 it softened and made the town look so I, welcome I don't when I go through it. Yeah, right. So, in so order not to, not to pay for them, we have to take them off the poles. So, we, so there'll, there'll be a charge for us to take them down and then we won't have to no, pay No, we pay to take them down. They don't pay for anything anymore. So we got to pay, take them down. Correct. We and own then, all our own And then they won't charge. How much is it for each one of those streetlights going through? What do you mean? How much oh, per year? Yeah. I don't know, because they're all they're all different size streetlights. So I mean, they don't give me a per year breakdown, but I can tell you we're saving a, a tremendous amount of money. But your recommendation probably would be to, I mean, you got to study it and look at it. Would your recommendation? Well, be Christine to, asked us to take them to. Disable them in the center of town, which we've done, and then if the board of selectmen or somebody decides to remove them, we'll remove them, and we send in an inventory to Eversource and tell them to remove them from the inventory. We get charged by the wattage for each light. I don't, I don't have that information. Any other questions? We have 1,700 streetlights. So. Any questions on streetlights? It looks like a big savings here. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can have some more. Up on your feet. I like that. Any other flattering comments? <laughs> I can't be all that. Well, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not so good. It's good. It's good. Keep, Keep it squirrel, Brad. Do the best we can. Okay, public works. We did that. Technology. Technology. What 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 tab? Twenty three. Twenty two. Am I going to get on? Okay. Technology. You're up again. Uh, huh? Technology. Technology. Well, I don't know. Technology. Technology department, which is this budget you got earlier. Lucky you to get to hear me again. I won't. Uh, I won't address line item one. Um, there have been multiple meetings with. Uh, Christine and Mary Ann uh, O'Donnell, tech, current technology staff, Board of Ed in the town, uh, try to come up with a staffing plan to address uh, technology uh, with the Board of Education in town working together. What that model will be at the end of the process, I can't, I can't tell you. I will tell you that the budget you see in front of you, you're going to see some line items that were $120,000 that are zero. You're going to see other line items that didn't, even, you know, that were twelve dollars that are now sixty-five thousand dollars. 
This budget is derived from a process of uh, <coughs> giving Dawn a hard time and having them print every invoice that was charged in technology last year as a routine cost. And then all those invoices, I evaluated all those invoices, categorized them, and uh, based on that information that I have, I realigned the budget to actually reflect what we actually do with technology as opposed to just a bunch of categories. So, in the process of uh, taking over the technology department in July, um, we ran into a situation where over a period of two or three years, maybe four years, uh, Board of Education Technology went here and Town Technology went over there. And basically, we were, uh, didn't talk to each other for the most part. We didn't work with each other for the most part. And basically wound up going in two different directions. The problem with that is that the towns uh, works together on a wide area network of which both the town and the board have been uh, the local area networks and we're both a member of the wide area network. And consequently, we had began to have counterproductive actions taken. Somebody would fix something over here and be counterproductive if that was happening over here. So the long and short of that is when I took over in July, we had a series of meetings with the Board of Ed. Um, the year before, we had spent a considerable amount of money rebuilding the wide area network, which was deficient. Um, and after July this year, we spent a considerable amount of money rebuilding our service systems, which were also very deficient. And uh, we were having issues with uh, the chief has often made a remark about where we were when, he, when we took over. Um, what you see in items uh, 3 through 10 is a joint uh, contract with the Board of Ed to support Board of Ed equipment and town equipment. I think right now, basically, uh, there's, equip there's equipment on both sides of the town and the Board of Ed network that we share. It's independent. We back each other up. It goes across the network. Um, their phone system backbone at the New Morgan is designed to accept the rest of the town as we move forward uh, to act as a single phone, which saves money long term in the cost. But basically what you're seeing on those items is really a joint venture to hire a single contractor to manage everything so that we don't have two different contractors performing two different functions and interrupting or counterproductive to each other. <coughs> Items uh, down, item uh, 16 through 21, you'll see Totalcom phones are the phone company that runs the town hall phones. Uh, Milestone Video is our annual licensing that runs all our cameras on the town side of the network. He said Antivirus is our antivirus that runs all our computers and, and protects all our systems on the town side. Um, you'll see a productivity office outlook. While we're, we're pretty certain that we have uh, all the licensing we need for all the computers we're using, we're not sure what the licensing allows us in, in terms of upgrades. So we still have quite a bit of equipment on uh, Windows 7 that need to be upgraded to Windows 10. So we've allowed a little bit of extra in there in order to be able to do that. The document management system is that is the annual cost of operating the document management system, 13500 uh, That's no matter how many different pods we put into it. That cost uh, is carried here. The actual cost of uh, any scanning or anything would be borne under this contract. Uh, GIS, it'll be a $4,000 annual maintenance fee once the system's up and running. On the next page where you see communication services, I actually went through every Comcast bill we own. I can vouch for you what they cost to have all these devices. What I can't tell you is why we have them. I know why I have some of them. But there's some, you know, there's two in the town hall, there's two at the park. I don't know why there's two in the town hall, and to be honest with you, uh, we just didn't, we were so busy trying to get the systems back up in, you know, in good shape that we really had time to look at this, though so it's probably one of the things that should become a priority. You'll see uh, a new one called Comcast Fiber, DPW Board of Ed Morgan. That was put in two years ago, and the agreement was it's a fiber link that goes from the Public Works Department to the Board of Ed. And part of expanding Board of Ed maintenance department into Public Works, they needed access to their control systems. It also allows us to do the phone system back and forth. And what was happening, we were relying on cable at Public Works. And when the power went out, the cable went out with it. 
So what happened during hurricanes or extended storms, we moved out any network, any ability to communicate with the rest of the town. So we did agree, we did decide to put the fiber link in. Um, the cost you see is uh, the 1375 is half the cost per month. What's been happening is the board of ed pays it the first six months and then we pay it the balance of the rest of the year. But everything else that you see there uh, is a cost associated with communication services in the town. So you see Comcast, you see uh, Verizon, you see Frontier. Uh, one of the things we just finished doing is we upgraded the phone system at the police department. Um, I think their phone system bill was averaging about, as near as I can figure out, having looked at it too, much, too long to really talk about it, about $1,600 a month. With the new system, it was a little bit over $200. So I did not take anything out of that at this point because we're afraid to shut off phone wires because we have no idea what they do. So we've stopped all of it, but we're sure we're going to come up with something that we probably shouldn't have poured it over and we'll have to pour it back. So it took a long time to account for all the fax numbers, the alarm numbers, uh, phone wires that went up north end and all over the place. So uh, we're going to sh start shutting those phone lines down before the end of the year, so you should see, or hopefully see a savings in the Frontier Bill at that point in time. Verizon Wireless, uh, my assistant went over the whole wireless bill. We uh, met with Verizon Wireless. We came up with a more economic uh, plan, which cut out about $300 a month off our plan. Um, I will say to you, however, though, the uh, use of tablets is going to increase. Because once we go to GIS, you know, there's going to be tablets and trucks so that we can go make corrections in the field as we need to make corrections in the field. Not in every truck in Public Works, but at least in three of the trucks in Public Works. Um, we also do all our work ticket information goes by GIS at this point. And so once you have GIS in, when we go out to the field and repair a catch basin, we have to actually go and uh, get the coordinates for that catch basin and our, uh, we have to list what actually happened to that catch basin into a database that's available to the state. So the tablet's wireless, but... Yeah, they're wireless, but you pay a certain amount a month for, per use for it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but you, can they be used as a phone too? Do we have to, we don't no, use, not really. Yeah. So, so why do you have to have a tablet and not a? Because the iPhone? tablet, you have to take a picture. You have to have a map so you can look at it and actually cite it on the tablet. You can't do that on a phone. Can't do that on iPhone. No, because you got to take pictures. You got to enter it into a record. You got to do all kinds of stuff. How many cell phones do we have? Pardon me. How many cell phones? I don't know. I, I all they do is inventory, and we knock the ones off that we knew didn't exist anymore. I don't have it in front of me. You have a significant amount. And, but you, you, you negotiated a better rate? Yes. Because, you know, we should get, with all the cell phones, we should get a, you know. Yeah, no, we, we did a better a lot, rate. A lot of the right. calls are inter, yeah. interagency here. We did a better calls, rate. Right? We have the ability to upgrade equipment at no cost and a bunch of other things that went on. And that's something that should be reviewed on an annual basis no matter what. In, in Comcast versus Frontier, I mean, is there, I mean. Is Frontier, is, Frontier is generally hardwired which the old PD system was an old AT&T business system that came in, you had a truck line of 50 phone wires that came into the building, whereas opposed to the town hall, you have a PRR line that comes into the town hall, it's one line, you pay $286 a month for it, and every call comes in and out of there, long distance, anyway. so that's all you get charged for your phone calls. If they, they offer, you get the fiber and all, you got, they have all the uh, fiber optics down there now, I mean, Ooh. do we, Frontier. Yeah, but they're the ones that are going to supply the PRI to the town. Anybody can supply it. And then Comcast. Or Comcast, is, Comcast is different. Really Frontier did not have a fiber that went up that way. So we had to use right. Comcast. And the, right. And the problem with Frontier is it wasn't going to be able to hook into our system where Comcast could hook into our fiber loop in town. Isn't there a nutmeg? Pardon me? Isn't there a nutmeg system? That's the state system. Do, are we connected to that? We use, I think we use yeah, the... Yeah, uh, the uh, library yeah. uses nutmeg as its internet in school. Well, the town uses nutmeg as its internet, and the uh, library uses um, CEN, which is the same network. So now, is there a cost attached to the nutmeg network, or does yes. I mean, I guess it looks to me like there's some room for consolidation, isn't there? You can't use the, the nutmeg network to connect uh, municipal billings together, strictly an internet service provider. 
That's where our internet goes up. Yeah. It doesn't go between buildings. Our fiber connects all the municipal buildings together in a large ring. So and can, who provides that? We do. We do. So is that a sonnet ring? No. Is it, it self-healing? Yes. It's redundant in uh, multiple directions, and it also has the ability to go through buildings to increase its redundancy. And we own that? Uh, I think we lease the fiber, but we own the equipment on it, yes. Fibertech. Is, uh, we, yeah. is that in Polo there? Is that yes, we keep Fibertech in there. Yeah. Monthly service, thirteen ninety-five. And then on the top issue, you said that you, that was someone That's because you actually paid for the installation of the fiber in town. It was like a... It was uh, Yeah, it was a bonding package. Bonding package that you had, where the Comcast fiber yeah. we did not pay to install. You could have been about 25000 bucks. And then you passed over uh, line one, right? Salary. Well, the only other thing I want to tell you about is, just so we're clear, the items 38 and 39, copiers and printers used to appear in the capital plan because we used to purchase them. Uh, no, nobody buys them anymore. So we put them into the operating for a leasing plan, and we'll work with the Board of Ed on the leasing plan. So those are included now. So when you look at the increase, when you look at our operating for 2018 19, it comes in at 366,457. But if you take away the new uh, programs that are involved in that, you're basically down to where you were this year, maybe a little bit less. So I have to account for the expenditures that I know lie before us. So that's what I've done as best I can. I'm not going to tell you that something is going to fall out of the sky. This is also put together, uh, I should have mentioned this in the beginning, Mike Neff, Mike Nato, and Frank Rossi from the uh, school system and the Mike Nato who works in town. We've all you been did. on this. You did mention it. Huh? You did mention Yeah. I did, I'm sorry. Well, we've all worked together on this, so this is not something that's just coming out. It's not. So that, that increase. And on the, back, on the last page is really our current inventory of copiers, of which a good portion of them are seven or eight years old. <coughs> Any other questions? Very not what we tap thirty six. Yeah, we'll okay. Thanks. Council meets September through December, made up of two representatives from the Board of Ed, uh, Board of uh, Finance, two representatives from the Board of Selectmen, and three members at large. Uh, basically, we start with everybody presents their uh, projects that they have in mind. We go through them department by department. We come up with a budget, and we pass that on to the first selectman. This year we have also added, if you see your sheets, uh, we've added a line called CEC Funding Other. And that's for projects that uh, have come before us, that the funding is rather large and probably out of the realm of CEC, or they are projects that are on the horizon that we want to make sure both the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance are aware of. Uh, so the uh, traditionally in the past some of these have come up and they, all of a sudden they appear and, and nobody knows anything about them. So we thought that uh, we would expand our horizon a little bit and make sure that people are aware that these are projects that we feel are worthwhile uh, of discussion and uh, are worthy. So I'd be happy to take your questions. I'm sorry, C-E-R-C other? 1819CC funding other. Oh, I got it. Fourth, okay, it's a call. I got fourth it. column over. Got it. So, 
And there are some, some reasons why the uh, CEC budget is larger this year. There is a uh, uh, technology increase in water pollution, which was not <coughs> hasn't been a part in the past. Appears this year also. So that's five million dollars for this water main project that you have yeah. in there. Yeah, it's uh, actually six point one five million dollars. Yeah. There are two projects for the fire department, water supply upgrade, and we asked uh, the fire department last year. Traditionally, um, the water supply has been funded out of CEC. It's also been the, uh, an easy target to cut. But right now, for them to put in a supply for fire prevention, a water pond, so to speak, uh, is about $150,000. And traditionally, that along with infrastructure gets cut. Um, so last year we asked them to go out and uh, try and find, uh, get somebody to review the whole project and come up with a price that could be available uh, possibly for a bonding package. So that's why the $3.5 million is in that column. And you will see that uh, in lieu of that we recommended, again, $150,000 and they have some money that has been left over from last year's CEC, and so the selectmen and the board of selectmen uh, cut it back to 80 because of the funds left over that would uh, allow them to do one pond or one tank installation. So, Mike, that 3.5 million would be water for the whole town? Well, that would do all the all the uh, all the ponds. I'm using the word ponds, basically an installation of a tank in the ground, and that would take care of all the locations in town that they have to do. And I know that it seems like a lot of money, and uh, I know what kind of times that we're in, but I think sometimes, you know, like the chief said, you know, it's, it's a public safety issue, and if your house happens to be near nothing, then it burns down. I, that's, that's, just, that's that map that I showed you. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I agree. I mean, I think so, you know, what, it, we, what we tried to do is bring forth information both the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance. So it could be a discussion because sooner or later, you know, some of these things need to be at least have a conversation about, you know, uh, again, and I think we need to start that now. And, you know, next year there'll be another bonding issue put forth. And some, maybe some of these projects need to be considered in that bonding package. But, you know, if we don't have a conversation in advance of the bonding package, then how do we determine what are the priorities in the town? And like I said, if, you know, fortunately, even though I live on Upper Cow Hill, you know, the North End Station is relatively close, so we just have to push the engine up Egypt Plain and then we get there. But if you live somewhere where, you know, there is no tank in the ground, then your house burns down. So, you know, so, you know, when they, they have continuously done this project over the past, past few years. So that's why we said, what does it cost to do to have the funds available in total? So they can go forward with their plan and decide <coughs> what are the, and I think they have addressed the most critical ones. So that's why the, that's in there. And same with, you know, the uh, water pollution also. I mean, sooner or later, we have to have a discussion as a town as to what are the issues that they were facing. One project that we didn't put in, which uh, is, I know that we just finished dredging the harbor, but in five to six years, we need to dredge the harbor again. And we're going to have to come up with five to six hundred thousand dollars. And how do, we, how do we address that? How many years has it been since we dredged the last time we have that time? I think it's seven, eight years? Eight years. Eight years? Eight years. So you're right. It was about two years overdue. Six to seven years. So you're raising some kind of sinking fund for something like that? Is well, that when I was reserve fund. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, five, six years ago, when I was on the board of finance, we had sinking funds, but we also had big surpluses too, which we don't have any longer. But again, it's something that if we don't 
you know, at least come up with a list of priority projects, then somebody's going to come and say, you know, okay, we're going to have to go out and do what we did, you know, last year and, and bond the dredging. So it needs to be, you know, there needs to be an ongoing list to our way of thinking, an ongoing list of projects that uh, have to be done. Whether we bond them, whether we put money aside, you know, that's something that, you know, a discussion needs to be with the Board of Selectmen, the Board of Finance, and, and I think the members of the town at large. But, you know, next year alone we're looking at another five plus million dollars in school roofs. And we're probably going to have to bond some more road projects. Plus two million of notes that have to be refunded. Huh? So that's basically, that's a long way of saying that's why we created this town. And you also find the, the, the police boat in there. Now the chief and the police department have done a lot of work uh, trying to find a boat and it's $183,000. And that, uh, an item of that large, it, we can't fund it out of CEC. So it's up to the Board of Finance to figure out how to fund it. But, you know, like she said, you know, the, the problem with the boat now is it's old and it's, the, it's not funded adequately. Um, and he's found a, over $300,000 boat for $185,000 minus whatever he can get for our current boat. Is there a window of opportunity where that boat won't be available for anyone? Well, it's, it's for sale now, but he does no. <laughs> it's closing rapidly. But that, so, you know, and those are the, some of the things that, that in CC we try to have to be a little bit forward thinking that, you know, we probably should have, the boat probably should have been in last year's CEC. So we could have brought it to, you know, both the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance's attention. Because right now, then we face the problem of, you know, the boat needs to be repaired. So it's 10,000 or 15,000 this year and maybe the same next year. And, but those are decisions that, you know, it's not up to us. We're passing along the information and hopefully putting on a, putting it on a wider agenda. It appears the Board of Selectmen has elected not to fund a lot of this, as I, if I'm reading this correctly. Well, they cut, they cut ours our recommendations down. Yes, that's you know I know it's, I know that they cut the infrastructure down a hundred thousand um, dollars. I would caution against cutting it. It's 400,000, last year was 390. And I would caution about cutting it too much more because infrastructure is just not, you know, uh, crack seal and repair of roads and things like that. Infrastructure has now become uh, funding of a lot of town projects. Uh, when I was on the Board of Finance, it seemed like every meeting, somebody was coming forward looking for money and transfer of funds and this and that. And, um, in the past couple of years, that hasn't happened because we have an infrastructure funds, and right now there's probably uh, 10 to 12 projects in that fund in addition to road repair. There's three projects at the library alone that need to be done, and that will come out of the infrastructure fund. And in October of 19, we have to pony up another $300,000 for rebound. <coughs> which nobody's talking about. Well, I'm sure you... I just thought... Uh, well, it's, not, it's not in CBC. I stand correct. Purview, so I, I can't really speak for that. So, I mean, I'm looking at this, it looks like you're pro proposing $3.5 million for the water supply upgrade, and the board selectman has cut that to 80000 that Well, right? that's the total cost of the project. In other words, what we did was we said, you know, we put in 150 in our recommendation, but we also want everybody to be aware of to do the whole project. That's what it would cost. Now, the chief can probably address doing it at 150 thousand. How long will it take to do the whole project? So the 3.5 number represents roughly 25 sites in the town that isn't serviced by hydrants, which is roughly 4,000 feet apart because we carry 2,000 feet of hose on the truck, so we figure we can go in each direction, so that gives you your 4,000 feet. Uh, that number also includes a substantial upgrade for a fire protection system for Cedar Island, which when we did the study of the town was found to be our number one target hazard. 
We just put a uh, four-inch main out there, right? Yep, you get 420 gallons a minute. And there's no way to really move it around the island except men and women that get across there on a boat and drag the hose through the sand. When's the last time you had a call out there? I'm not rolling the dice. So, so. Fortunately, we have not had any significant fire events, but... There needs to be some inspections out there, too, I think. There's it's residential. We have no jurisdiction either in the fire marshal. I think uh, um, building officials have jurisdiction. Send out the pump, the pump out. Yeah, we're going to get out boat and put a lot out with that. I mean, in dual purpose. It's like dual fuel. But <laughs> well, we have we have the pumper. Uh, <laughs> we have we have the the how much do we use the the pumper on the uh, fire boat? Do we do we use that to test it or is that still functioning or is that it's actually it's it's nothing significant. It's a portable pump that just sits on the deck of the boat. So we don't have the one that used to... It's not built in, it's not anything substantial. So... We have... Well, we had, we in had order to get that, we have to suck, call... We're sucking... It, it's <coughs> the nature of the location, you gotta get into the fight and then you suck at sand, so... We'll hope that something happens at high tide. So. <laughs> Plan it that way. Good. It's better than it was, but it could be much better. It's so, made. so these... these Areas that are not serviced by hybrids. I mean, is, do we have any idea of what the implications are for the cost of insurance for having that? Has anybody done a study of kind so of cost speaking of to some of the local insurance agents, uh, the homeowner could see, uh, and it, it only affects their the, the fire portion of their insurance. It's roughly an eight percent savings for somebody that has a hydrant versus not having a hydrant. So you got to look at it from the fact of. You're going to spend more than you're actually going to save, but you have to decide what having the guaranteed water there, like somebody that has a hydro does, is worth it to you. Well, it's eight percent a year, right? For yeah, so, but, a year. but if they're only paying a thousand dollars as part of their fire insurance, right. so you know, how long does it take to pay back? And right. But there's the intangible too. I mean, that's the tangible. But but the eight percent savings is based on if you had a hydro, not a not a tanker, right? No, because if you if you meet the nationally recognized standard for the tank size, so if the you tank meets that standard, you can apply money. to get the same rate right. throughout. Right. Right. And this three million dollars for the upgrade yeah. of headquarters yeah. looks like that is a non-starter. Yeah. What's that here? Looks like the, the upgrade of the of the headquarters, the fire headquarters, is a non-starter. But it yeah. should be a discussion, right? Should be a public discussion. So when I mean I guess you don't want to do this tonight. So no, not tonight. I don't think it was tonight. You can the, do it tonight. Uh, the fire the fire department did start the project technically. We paid for the town engineering company to come in and do a study and find out how feasible it was and what the plans would be and how much it would cost. That's how that number is generated. Is, is the uh, town engineer gave us what the proposed cost would be to do the addition. I just want to speak to underwater pollution. I think that this area is a little bit difficult for us to address where we're going. Um, we need to answer a lot more questions working with WDCC and CDM Smith. Um, it's been recommended that we have a meeting, a joint meeting, the Board of Selectmen, the Board of Finance, and that would have to, have to happen fairly soon. I do have a meeting coming up with Connecticut Water to discuss um, the contribution of them to the Rocky, uh, Rocky Ledge project. And until we know exactly what their contributions are, it's very difficult for us to make a decision on that as well. So I would say at this point, um, you know, moving forward, it's a little bit flux in whether or not um, you're able to operate that way until we have this joint meeting and make some decisions. Well, they're, they're looking at decisions to be made. Uh, they have timelines too, so the state People correct. They yes, say, they "Well, some of their money, some of their money just got pushed through the bond bonding the other day." I saw that. So I think it was the clean water was was part of it. But uh, you know, we 
we've had a lot of discussions here. I know there's been a lot of different discussions. Uh, uh, there's supposed to be some public public meetings. The, you know, the problem is that we need to uh, somehow or another people got to be convinced to support it. And you know, right now, I mean, I, if I had a guess and put it out there for both, you'd have a problem you'd probably getting it done. It's hard to get anything done. People are just Get to spend any money. And that's one specific project. Um, there's a number of projects within the capital right now, and I think we need to have a discussion which ones need to happen first, which ones will happen next. So there has to be a sequence. We actually have to plan them out and look at um, how much money is going towards CDM Smith's work, how much we can get from Pratt, um, how much we can get in-house. There's still some questions that need to be answered, and we have to sit down amongst ourselves and, and decide which makes the most sense to work on which year. Um, so these are, this is what was presented from the water pollution. Um, I think there's so many new people at the, the table, I think it's important for everybody to get up to speed on what we're going to do. Seems like the priorities have kind of been recommended to us, I think, haven't they? I mean, no, if, I look, I it if I look on, you know, the recommendation, 11, 9, 7, 10, 40, 42,000. I mean, those are all recommendations. It's almost everything except the uh, property acquisition and, and the water main itself. So the issue, it seems like probably the priorities are there, but the big, you know, the big elephant is the one that's that, that we've been talking about for a while. So that's the first of, of the big elephants. There are more big elephants coming down the road. Yeah, those are those. So whenever. Well, well, and that's I don't not think on this list yet, though. So no. much. I think you should have uh, Christy Wagner here to have that discussion. But yeah, those are parts of bigger projects. Well, and well if you, I mean, towards. as we have a presentation from the board, the board of education, I mean, I guess if you want to set something up jointly between the board of finance and the board of selectmen to, to, to talk about it, I mean, the Water Control Commission. Yeah, I mean, they're coming in. Because, I mean, if we're going bouncing back and forth like, like ping pong balls, I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, look, I'm open to suggestions. I mean, you have your meetings, we have our meetings, and, you know, that's what happens. I mean, in terms of, like, WPCC should know if they're spinning the wheels or not. Right. On this. Because they worked hard. You know, and, yeah, all along the idea was to get, you know, the two, the two big boards, Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen together. Um, so that because the water pollution control was done, we've done what we can do as far as you know coming up with a plan, uh, planning out our, our CEC and our, our yearly budgets. But I think what needs to happen now is the groups that make the decision on, on how to pay for stuff, you know, need to uh, you know be in the same room together and be in the same room with us so everybody can get on the same page. Like John, I know you're you're very familiar with this stuff, but I don't think everybody on the two boards is is, is all that familiar. I, I can even remember <clears throat> things have been recommended to us from the board of selectmen and that we've rejected them. I can't even remember the whole process. Yeah. But within a process, I mean sometimes things are sent down to other locations to be dealt with, if you know what I say what I'm saying, right? Well this was tabled yeah. by the board finance. We yeah. yeah. And then and then it was tabled long enough that it had to go back to the board of select. Correct. Yeah. Okay, now the board of selectmen. But sometimes kind of, people send things to a place where they know what happens. <laughs> well, the big deal here, and I, I, I think Christine was getting at it, was that um, uh, th that state funding from the um, uh, Department of Public Health has a has an element of grant involved in it, and it hasn't in the past, and it may not in the future. And it's um, we're looking at four hundred thousand dollars, and that's linked to this two thousand seventeen approval, which they have now extended through this this entire year for us. So if we're gonna if we're gonna get that money, then we need to make a decision on whether or not we think that's important. You know, if, if, you know that's a grant of four hundred thousand dollars, you know, to me. It sounds pretty important. Um, but that that that's all based on the um, end of this June uh, being in a be, being at a point where the Department, Department of Public Health says they'll you know it, that it's a, a viable project. Well, I, th I think that, listen, we, I think it would be helpful to know who's doing what, uh, you know, what's, what's being done, 
you know, who's paying for it? I mean, you know, if you're putting, it's one thing you put in Maine, and then there's another, you're, you're hooking everyone up, and then there's really issues about the, you know, the, you know, actual, um, I guess you could force, you could condemn the well and force people to hook up. I guess you could do that. That's, that's a tough call. I, I, I don't Because we actually have people who may say they don't want it. Yeah. Correct. Well, I, don't I, I don't think we can condemn the rules. All right. Well, we don't have any such ordinance in place. And well, we do I, look, you, I agree. Have it for another night. I mean, I, I don't think we're going to be able to deal with it at this, this point here. But look, I don't think, is anybody here not willing to sit down with the Board of Finance and have the, I mean, the Board of Selectmen have a discussion? I think we should. I think you have to. You have to. Just so why don't, why don't, what does it just get scheduled tonight? But Pretty you do it after yeah. it gets through the budget. I mean, I know the timeline. Is, is, yeah, it's getting tight. Yeah. yeah. So before the decisions are made for the budget, we do that before Oh, nice. So we would. So we'll do. Uh, so it gives us an extra either additional hours in a, in a night or another night or whatever we do. It's, it seems to me that what you do on something of that size would probably mm -hmm. require some bonding, right? So you'd have to send so you'd have to send that to referendum as well. Well, unless unless the four point nine million is available from the state, then it would become a loan. It's not. But you know, we have to. If you can't get a board of selectmen and a board of finance to say we agree on something, what's the chances are you going to be able to pass it? Zero. Now, I know there's consequences about who can come in and try to enforce things, but I, I, I think if you're really going to get this done, don't you have to have a consensus? Yeah, a lot of those discussions have been had together. They just haven't been had in the same room together. We just haven't gotten a consensus. Yeah. I mean, the D WPCC working with the town can 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 make the... We can you, make you this guys happen. have a consensus. We can make something happen, but we need to get... The, you know the town needs to make that decision that that's what they want to do. So we'll get so we'll get a schedule. Anything else? All right. So we'll meet today. What is it? Thursday. Next Thursday. Thursday, six thirty. You're gonna be there. Next Thursday. Yeah, of course. This Thursday. <laughs>